But mom, people are stupid on the internet. I have not done that in some time. I got a good four minutes into it and realized my little little green light wasn't on. From the top in three, two, one. Hi there, my name is Charles Ray Dawson. I'm the Associate Broker, Residential Sales Manager of ProStar Realty. This is the Unnamed Real Estate Podcast, episode 168. If you had been on, if you had been hearing what I've been saying for the last four minutes, you know, hope you guys are all having a great day. Uh, I've been running amok, if you notice a little color that I got going on, it's because I spent most of yesterday out uh, basically unscrewing a client's pool. Um, I, I know way too much about swimming pools. I really do. I hate them. I hate them with a passion, all right? Um, but got that all straightened out. It's Thursday. I'm recording. I got a, a fun topic that I can't wait to get to. So let's just get these numbers out of the way. Don't even know why I do them anymore. It's a labor of love. These are the numbers for April 24th, 2024. Active this week are 17,109, up 46. Our new listings are 2,204, down 131. Contracts were 2,660, up 92. Our closings were 1,592, and coming soon to an MLS near you are 715 new listings. Now, for on the Cromford Report numbers, we had uh, supply uh, rose a bit to 71.8. Demand also rose a bit to 79.7, but not as much as supply did, which means our Cromford Report number is decreasing to 111.1. As for our general areas and stuff like that, we have the big surprise, is surprise, they are the only balanced market out there at ah, check fire we also have paradise valley but we don't care about them all right so for surprise is the only balance mark right now for real people all right top of the list is chandler gilbert glendale and tempe and mesa they all lead the top into the seller's market and at the buyer's market side of the house we're looking at cave creek goodyear queen creek maricopa and buckeye buckeye is negative four and dropping their current index number is 64.2 all right now that I got that part out of the way, let's talk about what I want to talk about. So, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time with various podcasts, social media stuff going in the background. I have a lot of YouTube videos, and the algorithm starts identifying stuff that I'm interested in, and it starts suggesting stuff. And occasionally, they ex uh, suggest dumb people to me, all right, or ignorant, if they're not dumb. Sometimes I actually think that these people are actively malicious, like people are actively trying to spread mal and disinformation. Yes, there is a difference between mal and disinformation out there in the world to, you know, influence people usually to wind up giving them money. I haven't ranted about these guys in quite some time, but this particular video, I looked at it and I had that fun little duality of emotions that I get where at one point uh, there's that, that blind hatred and rage for evil. And then the other side is my chortling going, oh, now I know what I'm going to talk about this week. All right. So this is what we're going to talk about. There was a YouTube video or a Twitter video, something along those lines. I wish I had saved it. Um, discussing how only idiots buy houses and, you know, the secret that the banks are taking advantage of you on by pushing you into buying houses. What the Illuminati is using to control your soul. Whatever the background is. And usually this, it was a dude bro. You know, he, he had dude bro hair and dude bro thing. He was definitely had swallowed one pill or the other. Okay. And he's out there with the YouTube channel and a whole bunch more subscribers than me. So guys, like, share, subscribe. Help me out here. Help us fight the good fight against the forces of evil and stupidity. All right. So anyway, so he drops this thing about why people who rent are smarter than people who buy because people who rent can do things that people who buy can't. Now we're like, oh, yeah, you can move. You can do this. You can chase your dreams. You can live in a van down by a river. You can do whatever the hell you want to. Okay, that's awesome. But then he started throwing charts and he started throwing a lot of math down. Now, I'm doing whatever it is I'm doing. So I'm halfway listening to him rattle off the numbers. And occasionally I glance over at that other screen. And I'd see this chart. And at one point I actually had to pause my game and look at this chart. And I realized it was a bullshit chart. 
This chart was so bullshit. I haven't seen a bullshit chart this bad since I had my subscription to the New York Times. All right. It was one of those. Th there's a whole bunch of games you can play when you're trying to maliciously subvert people's thoughts by working with charts and graphs and whatnot. And I've covered this in previous episodes, right? But it was one of this thing wasn't even in the same hemisphere. All right. This chart was nothing but two lines on a screen. I realized that it was designed to be seen on a phone. All right. And so you're never going to be able to see the numbers on that. You're just going to see a red line and a blue line. And one line goes higher than the other. Yay, team. You want to be this line, not that line. This line, bad. This line, good. Listen to me and you'll be on this line. You know, that's the whole theory of it. So, and now all of a sudden they had my undivided attention. And I rewound and I watched the entire thing. And I really got the gist of his argument. All right, now. People who know me but know I believe in steel manning the other side's argument. So here's the argument. This guy believes that if you, in a market where it is cheaper to rent than to own, you should not own because then you can take the difference between the two and invest it. And at the end of the day, you will have all your money from that investing and you haven't been paying as much for housing. All right. I've heard this argument a lot. I've heard this arguments from friends that I thought were smart. Okay. I've heard it so many times. I actually really, really have gone many times deep down, second guessing myself and my career choices going, are they right? Are they right? Is, am I wrong? Could it be me? We all know the answer to that. It's never me. It's always you. Anyway. So, um, so I looked, you know, so I, Wrote down his numbers, figured out what he's doing, did not use his chart, did not save the freaking channel. All right. So here's, I'm going to use his environment. Okay. This is what he suggests. Okay. Now I haven't used this graphic in a while, but you guys remember this graphic, right? Hey, I am not a financial advisor and I'm not your agent yet. All right. Asterix. Okay. This is not investment advice or anything like that you'd have to be a complete idiot to take investment advice from ray all right i'm not giving you any advice on this i'm just literally using numbers that are accessible to you that i've researched to make your life a lot easier and i'm only using two off the top of my head i did use a couple calculator use calculator.net investopedia and god help me zillow all right to get the information Show notes below if you want to go to these places, but I think you remember calculator.net if I don't put it in the show notes, Investopedia, all right, and Zillow. So what do, what's our scenario here? Now, if you are doing any kind of scientific, uh, psychological, sociological studies, the best, the, the, the gold standard is the twins. Let's find two twins who grew up in two different environments. They have the same genetics. Let's see how they respond differently, all right? We're sort of doing that. But we got two twins, okay? Their name is Jack and Bob, all right? These are our assumptions for this, all right? There are two twins. Their name is Jack and Bob, okay? They both received $15,000 from their crazy Uncle Larry, right? Uncle Larry, for whatever reason, gives them both $15,000. And we live in an environment where rent is $200 less a month, which is pretty average in certain areas and definitely in uh, some parts of uh, Maricopa right now. But $200 less a month, all right? Jack's going one way, Bob's going to the other. Let's see how their lives turn out, all right? Let's start with Jack. Jack spends way too much time on YouTube uh, learning, um, date, you know, dating pickup things. He has not just, uh, he has gone way past the red pill, right in the black pill, and he's wallowing in full-on nihilism, all right? So Jack here, he gets his $15,000 and he listens to uh, people with, with much better production values than I do on YouTube. All right. And he decides to rent and he's going to invest that $15,000 into the S and P 500. Great idea. All right. If you ever come into found money, if you decide to invest it, I have no problem with that. All right. And because his rent is $200 less than his brother, Bob, he's going to take that additional $200 and he is going to invest it in that account that he's just put, you know, he's just opened with his $15,000. All right. So what this is going to do for him, 
All right, it's at the end of the year. All right. Okay, right about now, if I was a real financial advisor, I'd be sitting there explaining how this interest is not going to be perfectly accurate because of the way that they're going to be amortizing this, but still hear me out on this, right? At the end of the year one, Jack's $15,000 plus the extra money that he's put in. Because remember, he's putting $200 or 2400 a year, right? He's going to have contributed a total of $17,400 in his S&P 500's mutual fund. That's excellent, all right? He is going to have gained over this time $1,670 based on the average S&P 500's performance since 1957 to today. The S&P 500 has averaged 10.26% year over year. All right. Remember, this is an average over all those years. So it you got the stock crashes, you got the stock stock bubbles, it all chunks down into 10.26, right? So this is this is Jack year one. At the end of year 30, all right, he has made a total of eighty-eight thousand dollars in contributions. His initial fifteen thousand dollars and that additional two hundred dollars a month for 30 years. All right. After all this and with the interest, he's got six thousand, you know, or six hundred thirty-one thousand three hundred ninety-five dollars, right, in his S and P five hundred account. Make sense? All right. Now, here's the fun thing I want to point out because this is where it starts getting mathy. All right. I think that I, I want to say this is where that other guy made his mistake. If you sit there and you add this whole thing up, okay, you would say that he no, his account actually says seven hundred eighteen thousand three hundred ninety-five dollars. And 16 cents. You're right. It would say 700, but you got to subtract the 88,000 he put into there. All right. That's his money. All right. So his interest that he's earned is 631,395. All right. Got that? This is important. I think this is what that other guy was doing when he was messing with the numbers, trying to convince you he needed to rent a property from him. All right. So that's what he's made. All right. Now, and you can see how I got to that number. This is where he's at. This is what it comes down. You know, that's how much. Actually, I think I miscalculated on that one. But hey, let's keep going. All right. 631395 There we are. Good job, Jack. Bob. Bob does not play that much time watching guys on the internet. All right. He's not, you know, learning the pickup artist stuff about how to how to neg girls and this and that and the other thing or, you know, seven successful trips to seduce younger women. I swear to God that the algorithm decided I need to hear that, to see that the other day. And I'm like, why, why is YouTube thinking I need to learn how to pick up younger women? Does my wife know? Are they following my wife's freaking YouTube reading? And she's like sitting there going, how to kill your husband in his sleep. All right. And you, the algorithm realizes I'm about to be divorced. I'm going to have to go out there, hit the market again, and start trying to pick up hot chicks. I don't know. More than likely, it's just that, hey, I watch financial stuff. And which uh, for some reason, the algorithm has this really weird idea who I am. So I'm okay with that. But Bob, very boring, boring Bob. He takes his $15,000. Right. And he puts 12,000 of that down on a $400,000 house. Right. At a 3% down conventional. You can get these. You can get these with good credit. All right. Just remember in what, uh, whatever the scenario is, Jack and Bob had exactly the same credit score. In reality, Jack's probably got a lot less, worse credit score than Bob, but hey, we're going to give him the same credit score of whatever. It doesn't matter in this equation. Right. He's picking up a place, $12,000. All right on a 400k and he's got three thousand dollars worth of closing costs loan origination fees inspections this that and the other thing lord help him if he has to pay for his own real estate agent pay no attention to the snark there all right and he does nothing else with his life he gets up he goes to work he comes home and once a month he writes a check out to the mortgage company all right. what happens to bob okay At the end of the first year all right remember how i was talking about the the s p 500 appreciates that 10 percent Average home appreciation in the same time period is about 2%. Some people say it's 2.5, all right? I use the lower of the two numbers, 2%, which means on a $400,000 house that he put 15,000 total into between down payment and closing costs, he's got $8,000 at the end of year one, all right? Okay, 
So his first year, he's $8,000 to the richer, all right? He's actually, if you want to take the closing costs out of that, all right, he's at, he'd be 5000 but he's still money ahead inside of one year. All right, let's, get, let's continue on with what's happening in Bob. Bob's life in year 30, okay, when the mortgage is completely paid off, okay, his house is going to be $724,544.63, assuming it appreciates an average of 2% a year for 30 years. Now, this is where it gets fun. All right. If you hold on to any asset, Asterix, Ray is not a financial advisor, right? You have to ask yourself, how liquid is this investment? How quickly can I get cash out of it? Real estate is not considered very liquid because to utilize money out of that, you have to either borrow against it or you have to sell it. All right. <clears throat> so let's say he decides man i just clicked off the one wrong one so bob at year 30 all right that's him let's compare the two bob decides to sell all right he has to back out his original fifteen thousand dollars he had before all right that was the initial seed money that he put into it all right then he has a closing cost on top of the sales price bob is going to get six hundred fifty eight thousand eight hundred twenty six dollars and fifty cents your mileage may vary compared to Jack's $631,395 and 16 cents. All right. Bob wins. Bob wins. Okay. Because ultimately 2% depreciation on $400,000. All right. Will beat 10% starting at 15, even when you're adding that extra 200 on. All right. So now that I've made my argument, <clears throat> I, I can hear it. What do you hear? I hear, I hear the summoning horde of neckbeards. Yes, this guy. The well, actually, guys, suddenly pop up out of nowhere. I shouldn't make fun of this guy. He reminds me of a lot of guys I hung out in high school with, and Lord knows I had that complexion in high school. But what would be the argument against this entire thing? Right, first one is going to come out is going to be this. But what about repairs? All right, air conditioners hot water heaters, roofs, day-to-day -day repairs. As a tenant, I don't have to take care of any of that. I don't have to worry about my roof going out. I don't have to worry about my hot water heater going out. I don't have to worry because if it goes out, I just call my landlord and they come fix it right away. Because everybody knows when you call your landlord to fix a repair, they're instantly there within the next hour and magically do it. All right. Well, let's break that down. So I always tell my buyers, all right, and I'm telling you now, even if you haven't worked with me, you really need to start stocking away a little bit of money for these known repairs that are coming down the pike. All right. People who have paid attention to me, okay, no, I had a hot water heater blow out. All right. Total cost replaced for me to replace the hot water heater at the end of the day was about $650. Your mileage, not just might, will vary because I have social capital. All right. I was able to get that done for that amount. All right. That was an unexpected expense, but we had the money saved up. Why? Because we saved money. I save money. All right. So if you go and if you take, if Bob took an extra $50 a month, all right, and just squirreled that away, that'd be $600 a year, all right? Hot water heaters, warranty repairs, general last six years, six years for the cheap ones. You can buy the more expensive ones, but let's average that out. Let's say every six years you want to replace it. So every six years you will have thirty-six, you know, $3,600 to replace a hot water heater with. That Double it would cost you twelve twelve hundred. Okay, so you're still twenty four ahead. Make sense? Air conditioner about ten to twelve thousand. All right, lasts you about twenty years. All right, by constantly saving fifty dollars a month into your savings account. All right, maybe even put it into something that gets a little bit better interest and stuff like that. You'll have the money for those repairs. So what do we do? We're going to make this fair. We're going to give Jack that additional $50. So instead of just putting an extra $200 towards, you know, in, in his investment, he's now going to go 250. How does this change the numbers up? All right. Well, in year three, Jack wins. Jack actually at year 30, okay, we'll be clearing 722,000. I think think I backed out uh, his investments and everything like that. And he's looking pretty solid. All right. 
And let me double check his numbers that I got right here. You know, this this show is like one of those cl classic, uh, I'm doing the research, and I kept going, oh, how, what about this? What about this? What about this? And occasionally, even I have to cut myself off, right? But his total interest on that with, with $250 invested monthly, uh, it comes to 722744 So he beats Bob, right? Remember, Bob, that's, you know, 658 is based on his uh, closing costs and everything, right? So where does this put us? One thing I noticed right away, if you look at the uh, the schedule and everything like that, Jack finally catches up and gets in front of Bob at year 27. That's the power of $50 a month. All right. Huge, huge difference. All right. He actually goes from like, what, 633 to 722 with just an additional $50 a month. Think about that's going out to eat once a month. You cut that, put that extra $50 in. You know, there you are with your investments, right? <clears throat> so Bob finally passes Jack up, or Jack finally passes Bob up at year 27. Everybody's happy, right? Neckbeards have won. Their big, flashy production YouTube videos have, their point has been proven. Yay, team. Ray's wrong. I'm going to go slink into the corner. But you forget one thing. I am the Ray. All right. Because one thing these guys always forget is the rent goes up. And the average rent increase, and this is what I got from Zillow, is 2% a year. Doesn't sound like a lot, right? But that means that your first year, $2,000 rent is now going to be two forty. dollars right? Year after that, it's going to be you know $2,080, right? The year after that, year four, it's going to be $2,122. And in year five... You're going to be paying on that average rent that started off at two with a nice gradual 2% rent increase, which a lot of us right into the lease, you know, $2,208, $2,208. And guess what? Jack is no longer making that contribution that he was making before because now he's paying more in rent. All right. Here he comes again. Well, actually, yes, you're right. Well, actually, let's have a talk about this, okay? Because your taxes are going to go up on your property. Can't stop it. You guys keep voting the wrong way. Start thinking, keep thinking it's a really good idea to raise your taxes on yourself. I'm okay with that, all right? Assessor's going to come by. He's going to assess your value of your property a little bit more, a little bit more, all right? All right, and your insurance rate will probably go up, all right? But it's not going to go up like this. Okay. In the meat of your mortgage payment, the principal and interest are it's going to be flat for the next 30 freaking years. All right. So this exchange here is going to be way different. Okay. Basically, Jack doesn't have the $200 at the end of five, year five. Or if he's doing 250 at the end of year six to continue making that contribution. It's no longer the identical original argument made by the original video. All right. I think I want to point out in this one, all right, is I did the math. What happens if Jack stops making that contribution? Because his rent went up too high. All right. At the end of year six, he had $51,527.28. All right. If he just stood pat on that, and it just kept appreciating, he would have $485,589.76. That is the power of compound interest, boys and girls. That is still a good chunk of what he ever originally did with only six years worth of contributions. All right. The best time to start saving money is today, or yesterday, the second best time is today. All right. Now, let's give Bob an out here. This is Bob's out. At year six, he's going to have about $50,000 in equity on this thing. All right. He can then get a HELOC. He doesn't need to save that $50 anymore. All right. If the worst happens, he can actually turn around and use a HELOC to pay for it. I would encourage him to continue saving that money because he could put that in an interest bearing account. All right. To offset his overall house costs, but he's good to go. And finally, to wrap the whole thing all up, year 30. Let's say Jack and Bob were 25 years old when they bought this house, all right? 
let's say they were 30 years old when they bought this house. Jack went one way, Bob went the other, right? 30 years later, they're both now 60. They got five years to retirement. Right. Jack has all of his money wrapped up in um, his S&P 500 mutual fund. All right. Index fund. It's technically what it is. All right. Bob has all of his equity wrapped up in his house. All right. We already showed how Bob turns around and liquidates that. And we already cut that out of Bob's money, his, his expenses to liquidate his asset, that house, and get the money. Two things are going to happen here. One, Mr. Jack, I want to go right back up to year 30 for both of these. Mr. Jack, all right, is going to have to pay capital gains on $631,395.16. Bob, because he's been living in that house the entire time, will not have to pay capital gains. Jack is going to pay taxes. Bob is not. Bob already front-loaded his taxes. He was paying property taxes the entire time. It was baked into the cake. Jack has a bill coming due. All right. They also have five years left. All right. One thing that Bob can do that Jack can't is Bob can now take his mortgage payment that he used to be paying, but now that the mortgage is paid off, all right, he, he still needs to pay insurance. He still needs to pay taxes, but he can take the balance of that and then start his own 401k or IRA account or whatever. Taxes, you know, contact a tax advisor. Ray is not a tax advisor. Asterix, people, but still. And he, he doesn't have to worry about that when he retires. You know, he could live in that house until he shuffles off his mortal coil, right? Jack is going to keep renting. Jack will always be renting. You know, so... I quipped earlier today when I was talking to a friend of mine. It's like, you know, some people are just born to be tenants. And Well, we used to call them serfs, but we can't call them that anymore. So now we just call them tenants. I do not know why that individual YouTube channel really wants to put this information out. I'm pretty sure that he makes a majority of his revenue on um, YouTube ads, YouTube uh, payments and stuff like that. And so it, it pays to tell the mob what they want to hear, even if it's wrong. So any questions, complaints, or concerns or anything like that? Hey, guys, I could do this all day. All right. I've been doing it for 27 minutes right now. I hope I got this point across. I hope you guys figured out what I was talking about. If you have any questions, complaints, concerns, you can leave them in the show notes below or next time you see me at the bar. Okay. And um, hopefully I didn't miss anything on this. I should have some really clever segue right here. All right. All I know is that I can't talk about pools because uh, we did lose a child this week in Mesa. All right. To a pool. And so that's when I got out there on Wednesday and saw that particular pool and the condition of it is one of the big things about having a pool that you can see at the bottom is when they're looking for the missing kid, they don't have to send a diver down to your nasty ass swimming pool because you let it go green. All right. So watch the kids before. And pets, and we don't have to send somebody into the diving pool to go and you know into the diving pool to look to see if there's anybody at the bottom of it. All right? I don't think we have to worry about driving in anything flooded right here. Work your circles now more than ever, and of course, I hope you guys have a really great week. Talk to you later.